Okay, uh, today what we want to get into, we're into kinetic theory, remember, and what we specifically want to get into is kinetic theory with a magnetic field. Now, to do this upright takes a, a good bit of effort, uh, so we won't be into that in, in too much uh, detail, let me put it that way, but uh, what we will do is try to give a bit of an overview, uh, so let's just call this kinetic theory. Uh, with a magnetic field. Now, because it's kind of a complicated subject and to do it upright would take a lot of doing the lectures in detail and so forth and so on, I won't really um, go into detail on some of the things. I'll just kind of sketch how all this goes and then you'll just have to believe me the algebra sort of works out right. I do the algebra a little bit differently than Chen does in his book. Um, so there's a business there as well, or so there's a little bit of difference, but I try to do it in a little simpler way, uh, at least simpler to me. Okay, uh, previously we've been worried about, you know, free streaming. We had particles, you remember in Landau damping and these singularities, physically what was happening was the parallel phase velocity, or the phase velocity, became equal to the particle speed, right? It was, you know, resonant with some group of particles. Now, in a magnetic field, uh, the basic problem is that um, what happens is that you have parallel free streaming, parallel to the magnetic field. Remember when we talked about particle orbits. But perpendicular, we have gyro motion. So you remember if I uh, took a look at some, say, magnetic field line here, and I had some particle moving, what it would actually be doing was, you know, gyrating around the field line, and it had some parallel motion, and then perpendicular to the magnetic field, it had a gyro radius, which was equal to V perp over omega C. So the question is, what happens kinetically then when we put in these basic differences uh, of the magnetic field turning, you, you know, making the medium anisotropic. Namely, I can move freely along the magnetic field, but perpendicular to the magnetic field, I have this difficulty that I have um, gyro motion. Now, sort of what happens, just to, to guess a little bit, is that the parallel motion is going to be just as if I didn't have the magnetic field. So, because it's free streaming again. Now, if I turn the magnetic field and have an inhomogeneous magnetic field, then it can get a little more complicated, okay? Uh, then I can, you, you know, then I'll have a little bit of, say, bounce motion or something like that. But we're only going to consider the simple case of a homogeneous magnetic field. So, uh, basically, along the magnetic field is going to be as it was before, just free streaming. On the other hand, perpendicular... Um, I just can't move with the wave, but on the other hand, there, you remember there was a particular frequency here, cyclotron frequency. So you can imagine that if I somehow hit the frequency of some oscillation, you know, like I was trying to stimulate something or something like that, at the cyclotron frequency, I might get a resonance. So we can expect some sort of cyclotron resonances perpendicular to the field uh, and parallel just free streaming. Now, what we will do is we'll consider sort of the simplest uh, case. So let's consider the uh, simplest case assumptions, let's say. And those are, uh, first, that we have a homogeneous uniform, that is, uh, magnetized plasma. Magnetized, remember, means that our cyclotron frequency is significant, not nearly zero. And what we sort of really mean by that is that, in fact, we'll take the magnetic field as uniform and in the z direction, b is equal to b naught z hat. Uh, we'll have no electric field in equilibrium, uh, just again for simplicity, and no drifts. We might have an E tilde cross B, but no equilibrium drifts. And gradient of the density is equal to zero, 
and equilibrium density and so forth. The second thing is we will consider electrostatic perturbations. which of course just means that E is equal to minus grad phi. And finally, um, we'll consider uh, a simplified wave vector because since we're infinite and homogeneous, there's no particular direction perpendicular to B that makes any direction. Uh, you know, we'll have, say, Z is the direction of B, but then perpendicular to that, we'll have X and Y and there's no particular direction picked out by the equilibrium. So therefore, we'll pick a direction by the k-vector, which direction the longitudinal or electrostatic wave is moving. So what we'll choose is that the wave k-vector uh, is in the xz plane. By this, what we will mean is that the k-vector is equal to kx x-hat plus kz z hat. But since I'd like to kind of keep in mind directions relative to the magnetic field, uh, I will usually write this as k perp x hat. Perp just happens to be in the x direction. And then plus k parallel z hat. Okay? Where we have set y, uh, ky equals zero. Um, basically because of symmetry. Perpendicular to the equilibrium magnetic field. There's no particular direction to that. Okay, so this is the, the basic thing, just an infinite homogeneous plasma with an infinite homogeneous magnetic field. So that ought to be sort of simple. Um, the, what do we need for our kinetic equation then? Well, again, we're most interested in our so-called Flazov or collisionless kinetic equation. And uh, for that, what we do uh, is just write it out. df dt is equal to zero, remember. df dt, where f is a function of x, v, and t. But this is equal to then the partial of f with respect to t plus uh, v dot partial of f with respect to x plus the acceleration per unit mass, q over m, or sorry, the acceleration force per unit mass, the Lorentz force, q e plus v cross b dot df by dv. And, of course, because we're a kinetic, a collisionless situation, that's zero. Now, we haven't done too much of this in kinetic theory yet, but the first thing you should always do when you're going to consider perturbations is ask, what's the equilibrium like? Okay, so if I'm going to perturb an equilibrium, I better make sure I know what the equilibrium is, is the basic idea. So let's consider the equilibrium. And what we mean by that is that we'll take that this distribution function is going to be some equilibrium distribution and what can that equilibrium <laughs> distribution depend upon? Space? No, we said it was infinite and homogeneous, so I can't let it depend upon that. You know, it's homogeneous in that. Velocity space is okay, right? Because there's nothing that I said that eliminated that. Time? Now, equilibrium means, you know, equilibrium. And then I'll have, imagine that I was going to say that I have F tilde, and a perturbation away from the equilibrium. But in general, that F tilde should depend upon uh, all six phase space dimensions, three space, three velocity space, and time. OK, so let's just write out our kinetic equation, substituting this in. Um, and also, I guess we should say that we have an electric field is equal to an E naught plus an E tilde. However, pragmatically, uh, we said a little bit ago that we were going to consider a case with no equilibrium electric field. So we'll just take that out. So uh, with that in mind, we'll have 0 is equal to the partial. Now, um, I'll, well, okay. For the equilibrium, 
by the equilibrium, I mean I'm only going to substitute in F naught, okay? So we'll have DF naught DT plus V dot DF naught by DX uh, plus Q over M E naught plus V cross B naught dot DF naught by DV is equal to, well, is equal to zero again. But the time derivative of F naught has to be zero for equilibrium and time. Spatially homogeneous equilibrium, DF dx vanishes. No electric field. So all in all, all we're left with is that we have to have Q over M V cross B. Let's say zero equals Q over M V cross B naught dot DF naught DV. What, uh, what is that? Well, this says it's the Lorentz force per unit mass, so it's a Lorentz V cross B acceleration dotted into the gradient of the distribution function in velocity space. So it's a, a turning type of thing, okay? Now, there's a way of evaluating this, and I won't go uh, do it in detail, but, but let me just say what the answer is. What it turns out is, you remember QB over M is the cyclotron frequency. So you can imagine that this is going to have units of cyclotron frequency and the two velocities cancel out. And so it turns out it's minus cyclotron frequency times df naught by d phi, where phi is the angle in velocity space. Namely, what I've said is that the velocity variable is going to be like a v perp, a phi, and a v parallel. And those are analogous to radius theta and z in cylindrical coordinates. So in other words, what I've done is defined a uh, cylind I guess I should say drickle, cylindrical coordinates. Uh, anyway, so what I've defined is a um, cylindrical velocity space. Okay? Now, so therefore, my distribution function, which I thought was a function of v vector, all three coordinates, was a function of the perpendicular velocity, which is analogous to radius in the cylinder, the, gyro, the, the angle, which is effectively the gyro angle here, and the parallel part. But because of this condition, okay, on the equilibrium, it says that I must have d phi dt, or d, df d phi is equal to zero. So it says, in fact, I cannot, in equilibrium, allow a distribution function which depends on angle, okay, perpendicular to the magnetic field, on gyro angle and velocity space. So that is to say the distribution function can only be a function of v perp and v parallel. But you know, that's, is that a Maxwellian? How about it could be, but in principle I could have a different perpendicular temperature compared, you know, perpendicular to the magnetic field and parallel temperature. Those could indeed be different. Um, but it turns out that, uh, this, so this is our equilibrium distribution function, and it turns out though that uh, we will usually choose and specifically, we, we will choose later, uh, but we will usually choose a Maxwellian. Um, this is a little more general than that, uh, and well, and for a Maxwellian, maybe I should just write that down here. We would have F naught is equal to F naught of energy, or mv squared which would be F naught of V squared, let's say, which would be F naught of V perf squared plus V parallel squared. So that's what we'll usually choose. But if I was trying to treat a magnetic mirror machine where I have a loss cone and I have, you know, some particles are missing at some ranges of V perp and V parallel, then I would have to choose a more general distribution function but then, truthfully, in that situation, I would have to have an inhomogeneous magnetic field as well. So it would be a little more complicated for other reasons, usually. 
But anyway, so the, the gist of this is that, yes, I can have a more general than just a usual distribution function being a function of the energy. Namely, I can have it v per v parallel, but uh, I will usually just choose it to be Maxwellian for simplicity here. If you go into 724, of course, on waves and instabilities, then we do that stuff up with um, uh, perpendicular and parallel being different. Okay, we had our equilibrium kinetic equation or equilibrium uh, version of the Flazov equation. What we next want to do is do the perturbation. So we stick that in, and what we end up with is df tilde by dt plus v dot um, the f tilde by dx. Now realize what we're really doing is substituting in the full f and, you know, everything uh, and subtracting off the um, equilibrium parts, but I'll already assume I've done that. Uh, so we got v dot df t, uh, tilde dx. Now I'm going to write this out a little bit in detail here. We'll have q over m e tilde plus v cross b tilde uh, all dot df naught by dv, but then I'll also have q over m e naught plus v cross b naught dot df yep, tilde by dv is equal to zero. What about some of these terms? Well, oh, and I'll have I would have e tilde. F tildes, but those would be nonlinear terms, right? So let's say plus nonlinear, which we're neg neglecting. Okay, now E naught we said was zero, so we don't have that term. Uh, B tilde is equal to zero because we said we had electrostatics. So there's no fluctuating magnetic field. And um, this last term, I won't do this, but this last term, because from the way we wrote it before, could be written as minus omega c df tilde by d phi. But I want to show you a little different way of doing all this, so I won't end up doing that. Um, but now look at the equation I have left. I have partial respect to t plus a free streaming term, basically. And then here's another v cross b dot df dv, df tilde dv. But then there's this other term, which is not an f tilde, not an operation on f tilde, but rather this other term, the e tilde, is an inhomogeneous term relative to this differ differential equation. So I should stick it on the right-hand side. So if we do that, we write this as partial of f tilde with respect to t plus v dot um, partial of f tilde with respect to x plus q over m, uh, sorry, v cross b naught dot df tilde by dv. And then this is equal to this other term, which is of a different type, namely q over m e tilde dot df naught by dv. That's a sort of inhomogeneous driven term. And since E is equal to minus grad phi, because we have electrostatics, this becomes Q over M grad phi tilde dot df naught by dv. Now, what kind of an equation is this for the perturbation F tilde? Well, it's a first order, no higher than first order partial differential equation. There's no more than one derivative any one place, right? So it's a first order partial differential equation. Um, but it's got a total of seven derivatives because it's a six dimensional space space, okay? So it's in seven variables. And those are, of course, our three space coordinates, three velocity space coordinates, and the time coordinates. 
How do you solve such equations? The answer is not supposed to be punt, okay? The answer is we're supposed to solve it. So how do you solve them? Well, if I just had, suppose I didn't have six variables here. I only had partial respect to t plus vx df dx. You would say, well, I'll just solve it by the method of characteristics. That is to say, I'll find a characteristic which amounts to taking motion not at one or taking the time derivative not at one spatial position x, but rather moves along with, say, vx df dx. And so the method of characteristics says basically transform the equation from being at one time to moving along the orbit, which in our case is going to be a gyro motion orbit. So, and, and we'll talk through the mathematics in a moment here. So we solve by method of characteristics and so I'll try to, to illustrate that on the on the next one here so characteristics solution <coughs> of the F tilde equation. Well, first let me just write it down. I've got df tilde by dt plus v dot df tilde by dx uh, plus q over m uh, v cross b naught dot df by dv uh, is equal to q over m grad phi tilde dot df naught by dv. What do we do in the method of characteristics? Well, what we do is we identify this as dx dt. We identify this as dv dt, the acceleration. Okay. And then we prime everything in sight to say that what we're going to do is go along some arbitrary orbit. Okay which is, it just means along the primed orbit. And then if I do all of that, then this becomes the total time derivative of f of x prime, v prime, t prime, dt prime, where t prime is the time along that orbit. So we're going to have a gyro motion orbit, and t prime is the running time as I go along that orbit, basically. And this will be then equal to q over m grad phi tilde. But now that grad phi tilde dot df naught by dv has to be also okay, evaluated at time t prime, the running time along the orbit. And the orbit characteristics okay, are given by these equations, namely dx prime by dt prime is equal to v prime, almost an identity, and likewise dv prime dt prime, the acceleration, is equal to q over m v prime cross v naught. Now, these are rather general characteristics, orbit or trajectory characteristics, but we need uh, initial conditions such that at time t prime equals t, that is when this running time variable along a gyro orbit becomes the same as my present time, then I'd better be at my present position, x. Likewise, I do the same thing, v prime at t prime equals t is equal to v. This is all just sort of formal mathematics to be able to do all this. But the advantage of doing it is that now I have a total time derivative, and all I have to do is I can integrate this equation, dt prime, you know, and I can then get my f. Where would I like to integrate from what time to what time? Well, I'd like to integrate from wherever the particles were a long time ago up until now. 
a long time ago will be defined as t prime goes to minus infinity, and now is t prime is equal to t. So what you do is you integrate from minus infinity to t. Now, the left-hand side is then just going to be f evaluated at time t minus f at minus infinity. So let's just do that. So solution for f tilde, uh, namely, just this, this first integral just becomes f, I'm going to make it at, at time t prime uh, equals t minus f at t prime equals minus infinity is equal to, what about that thing? Well, we'll just leave it. We're going to have to work on it. So it's called the time history integral. It's the history of where the particles were of, of the acceleration dot gradient of the distribution function integrated from a long time ago up until now. So it's dt prime q over m. Charge and mass don't vary as I move along the orbit. So that's no real problem. So this is grad phi tilde dot df naught by dv. And again, I'll evaluate it at t prime. But if I set up my characteristics properly, then f of x prime, v prime, t prime, when I evaluate it at t prime equals t, the x becomes x prime becomes x, the v prime becomes v, and the t prime becomes t. So that's what I really wanted to know, namely, sorry, these are f tildes. Uh, this is f tilde of x, v, and t. And I'll just leave in the initial conditions, but you remember when we did initial conditions with the Laplace transform business, we really didn't care about the initial conditions later. So we'll just kind of leave it and then I'll ignore it in the moment. So our, our net solution is that f of x, v, and t is equal to, I'll stick this over on the right-hand side, is equal to what the perturbed distribution function was a long time ago, uh, plus the distortions that have happened since then by the acceleration dotted into the gradient of the distribution function. So that's our solution. Um, so this is the initial perturbation. Um, and this is the time integrated uh, delta F plasma response. Uh, due to basically Q over M E tilde dot DF naught DV integrated from you know, long time ago to now, so-called time history integral. Okay, now, uh, so what do we want to do with this? Well, we'd like to, uh, in a moment, by the way, we're going to say neglect the initial perturbations. And why are we going to neglect them? Well, if I was treating an instability, you know, I started with some small perturbation and it grew for a long time, Eh, the initial perturbation is not very important. So that'd be great. On the other hand, what about if I was talking about a oscillation that was uh, stable uh, you know, or damped or something like that? Uh, maybe the initial perturbation is bigger than the time integrated response. But usually what we're calculating is dielectric constants. And if you remember our initial value problem, uh, we needed the initial perturbation, but then ultimately when all was said and done, we just uh, neglected it, basically. Or it was just the source function, and so we don't need to worry about it. So we'll just neglect it. We won't really worry about it. Okay. Now, there's an additional simplification or manipulation, I guess is the best way I can say it, that we can go through if the distribution function f naught is a function of a Maxwellian. So let's uh, look at that. So let's suppose f naught is equal to a Maxwellian, 
And what is the Maxwellian distribution? Well, it's n density, uh, m naught, n naught actually, m over 2 pi t, all to the 3 halves, uh, e to the minus mv squared over 2t. So if I now take the partial of f naught with respect to v, which is what I uh, seemed to need, um, then I take the derivative of this, and I'm going to get minus. I'm going to, the only thing I take the derivative on is this Gaussian exponential factor. So this becomes mv over t, and then we get n naught m over 2 pi t, 3 halves e to the minus mv squared over 2t. And lo and behold, this is all our original Maxwellian. So the net result is we can just write this as mv over t times f Maxwellian. Um, so that's nice. Now, to remind you what we had up here, we had, oops, that uh, we needed underneath here grad phi dot dfdv. So let's just take grad phi tilde dot df naught by dv. And that will, well, and I'll put in a q over m, uh, which was the factor that went out in front. And so this becomes q over m grad phi tilde dot minus mv over t times f Maxwellian. Now the two mass factors cancel. And this just becomes then minus q over t f Maxwellian times v dot gradient phi tilde. What good does that do me? Well, it turns out it does pretty, but pretty uh, a lot of a lot of good. Um, let's remember that phi, or phi tilde, is only a function of x and t, and that we're evaluating all these things along the particle orbit. Remembering that, then d phi tilde by dt would be equal to the partial of phi tilde with respect to t plus dx dt dot d phi dx, or grad phi. dx dt is just the velocity of the particle, actually. And so this would be partial of phi with tilde with respect to t plus v dot gradient phi tilde. So what this tells us is then that we can write that v dot gradient phi tilde is in fact the total time derivative d phi tilde by dt minus the partial phi tilde with respect to t. And now the idea is I substitute this back into there. And then what we finally find is that q over m grad phi tilde dot df naught by dv is equal to um, minus q over t f Maxwellian. And then all we get is d phi tilde by dt minus partial of phi tilde with respect to t. So that was the integrand, critical integrand that we needed inside of the time history integral. So now we'll just go back and put that in. Um, so let's see, it's hard to get all this down the other way, this way. So there was our kinetic equation, and there's what we found that we needed for it. And so what we find is then that f tilde of x, v, and t is equal to, now q over m already 
took out in front and so forth. So you see what I get is minus Q over T Maxwellian. Um, do I have to leave that inside the time history integral? That's a DT prime, by the way. I forgot to make that, mention that. Well, the Maxwellian, you know, doesn't matter whether I'm along a moving orbit or not. It's still the Maxwellian distribution function. Basically, the energy, mv squared over 2, is a constant of the motion. So whether it comes in or out of the integral doesn't matter, so I'll take it out. So what we get is then just a Maxwellian, and then the time history integral, d, integral minus infinity to t, dt prime. And then we have d phi tilde by dt prime. Uh, and then minus, <coughs> minus partial of phi tilde with respect to t prime. Now, the first one is a total derivative, so I can actually integrate it, no real problem. So all you get is minus q over t f Maxwellian, and then phi tilde, and I evaluate it again It'll be phi tilde at its upper limit, t prime equals t, which is in just, in fact, phi tilde of x and t. And then I, I would have an initial condition, minus phi tilde of minus infinity, but again, we'll neglect the initial condition. Um, and then I've still got this time history integral, which I have to perform. Um, so I'll leave that as minus infinity up to t, dt prime, partial of phi tilde with respect to t prime. Um, but now let's go sort of one step further. We usually imagine, uh, as we will now, assume we have perturbations. Of the form uh, that phi tilde is like e to the i k dot x minus i omega t, you know, just plane wave oscillations. For that, the partial of phi tilde with respect to t becomes minus i omega phi tilde. Right? So sticking all that in, we find that our distribution function f of x, v, and t just becomes minus Q F Maxwellian over T times phi tilde, let's say, of X and T, just to be specific. And then we've got a minus sign and minus I omega, so that'll become plus I omega integral minus infinity up to T dT prime phi tilde of X prime T prime. And now is a good place to pause and say a little bit what these various terms mean. And what do they mean? Well, suppose I took the integral over all velocity space so as to get the density perturbation from this distribution function perturbation. So if I do that integral over all velocity space, I'll get integral over a Maxwellian just gives me density. So this would be nq over t phi tilde. Well, that's actually just the adiabatic part. Okay? If you remember, we took uh, if the distribution function was the so-called Gibbs distribution, e to the minus q phi over t, and you perturb that, this is the linearized adiabatic response. So this first is, called, is the linearized adiabatic response. Well, if that's the adiabatic response, what's the other part about the non-adiabatic response, right? And what is it? Well, it says what you do is if there's some frequency, okay, non-adiabatic responses are usually proportional to the frequency, that you integrate the perturbed potential as seen along the moving gyro orbits, okay? Integrate it from a long time ago, minus infinity up to now, and figure out how much sort of delta phi there has been along that orbit, and then multiply it by omega. In the limit that omega goes to zero, you'll, of course, get no significant uh, 
correction due to this uh, for the most part. But anyway, so this is the, the non-adiabatic, sometimes called time history integral. Or I usually call it that. I don't, a lot of people call it that. So, now that then is our solution for F tilde, except that now we've really got to put in, we've avoided it up until now, I should say, we've really got to put in what the orbits really are, okay? Because we know that phi tilde is going like e to the i k dot x minus i omega t, but we really have to go in and decide where the orbits, I mean, you know, where x prime, how do I put in this gyro motion? Okay, we finally have to face up to that. We've kept formal mathematics at bay. So let's talk about particle orbits. Um, actually, what I need to do, well, okay. Uh, if you just go back to what we did uh, from, turns out, uh, on the lecture on February 1st, we had that x was equal to uh, x naught uh, minus v perp over omega c uh, cosine minus omega c uh, t plus phi minus cosine of phi, and y was equal to y naught plus v perp over omega c uh, sine minus omega c t plus phi minus sine phi. And that was, you know, perpendicular motion. I have gyro motion at the cyclotron frequency. And then parallel, I have Z naught plus V parallel T. Now, uh, so those are the orbits I need to plug in. But, you know, it's a little bit easier to maneuver things a little bit. So let's remember that we really wanted to calculate minus infinity to T dT prime phi tilde of X prime t prime, but this is of the form minus infinity up to t dt prime of a, a sort of phi tilde hat or something, the constant that goes out in front, and then e to the i k dot x prime minus i omega t prime. Now, I'd really like to take that outside, so what I'll do is I'll add in another factor of e to the i k dot x minus i omega t, and then, uh, I'm sorry, minus that plus that, and then I'll add in another factor to compensate for it of e to the plus i k dot x minus i omega t. And with respect to this t prime integration, so this is just one, with respect to this t prime integration, this I can take outside. So I just put and took, took the, put this factor and took it out, uh, in and take, took it out. Likewise, I can take the phi hat out in front. So if you do that, then you construct phi tilde hat e to the i k dot x minus i omega t, and then the integral from minus infinity up to t dt prime of e to the i k dot x prime minus x and then minus i omega t prime minus t. But this thing out in front is now just phi of x and t. And we now find it convenient to define t double prime as t prime minus t. And so, uh, and then we'll... <laughs> We'll call this quantity x double prime, and that just becomes t double prime. And so finally what we get is phi tilde of x and t, integral minus infinity to t, I'm sorry, dt double prime, integral minus infinity to zero now, because at the upper limit t double prime, this shifted time becomes zero, the present time. And e to the i k dot, uh, well, I'll still leave it as x prime minus x and then minus i omega t double prime. 
So really what I need is not the instantaneous orbit, but the orbit minus where it was before. Um, but really I only need k dot x prime minus x. And you remember we decided earlier that it was perfectly reasonable to select a direction for our k, namely that we had that k was just equal to k perp x hat plus k parallel z hat. So when I, uh, well, figure all this out, let me just put it that way, stick all this in, then what I find is that e to the i k dot x double prime minus i omega t double prime turns out to be the exponential of minus k perp v perp over omega sub c times sine of theta turns out theta, well, I've used my gyro angle phi has become theta minus pi by 2. I just uh, shifted it by pi by 2. Anyway, theta minus omega c t double prime minus sine of theta. And then there's another term up in that exponential, which is plus k parallel v parallel minus omega times t double prime. Okay, now let's look a little bit at what we have. I'm sorry, this should be an I there. So what we ended up with was we wanted to calculate this non-adiabatic response, and we manipulated it to the place where it just became this time history integral of this exponential. Now, if I didn't have these signs in here, okay, like k perp was equal to zero, I would just get e to the i k parallel v parallel minus omega t. That I could perform. It's e to the i something t, you know, so forth. What am I going to do with those sines and cosines? Well, this is a, at the point at which you have to invoke another thing, which is a key, let's call it a key, Bessel function identity. By the way, why is it kind of complicated? Well, what it represents is k dot x, and the particle is gyrating back and forth. So the gyrating back and forth is this cyclotron frequency here. It's gyrating back and forth across the field line uh, with a modulation factor of k perp dot gyro motion. And the sine theta just represents the initial phase. Okay, the key Bessel function identity is that plus or minus e to the plus or minus i z sine alpha, which I'm sure you've all seen before, but I'll just remind you of it. n is equal to minus infinity to infinity j n of z e to the plus or minus i n alpha. Okay. Now why is that useful? Well, it turns out that if you then write e to the i, use this identity and do it in e to the i k dot x double prime minus i omega t double prime, that you can write that as the sum. There's two signs you have to expand. So there's a sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity and a sum of n prime equals minus infinity to infinity. And then there's a jn of k perp v perp over omega sub c. Same thing, jn prime of k perp v perp over omega sub c. And then all of this inside there gets multiplied by e to the i n, sorry, eh e to the i n prime minus n times theta plus i n omega c um, plus k parallel v parallel minus omega times t double prime. Now the advantage of that is that I may have gotten a double summation, but I got something that's just e to the i omega t, Doppler shifted frequency. Now, the final thing to note is that, uh, relative to all this, is that later all this came up because I'm calculating a perturbed distribution function, 
And in a moment, I want to calculate a perturbed density. So I'm perfectly happy, it turns out, to calculate not the full distribution, but average over theta. And if I average over theta, then this just becomes a chronic or delta. Says replace says I only have n prime equals n. So if I have e to the i k dot x double prime minus i omega t double prime, and that average is equal to 1 over 2 pi integral from 0 to 2 pi, uh, d theta of e to the i k dot x double prime minus i omega t double prime, then that just becomes the sum over n equals minus infinity to infinity. And now I just get Jn squared, k perp, v perp over omega c. And then my exponential factor, this n prime equals n, the theta dependent factor goes away because I average over it. And all I get is e to the i um, n omega c plus k parallel v parallel and then minus omega t double prime. So my phase factor now represents not just e to the minus i omega t and parallel streaming, k parallel v parallel, but now it has harmonics of the cyclotron frequency weighted by a Bessel function, which is giving us an amplitude-dependent factor depending upon what the ratio of the gyro radius to the perpendicular wavelength is. OK, we'll stop here and uh, come back to this. But we're almost through with this derivation, and then we'll talk about pragmatically how it all goes together and gives us uh, a dispersion relation, and then we'll talk about some simple cases of that.